On today's agenda, we've got our usual HackFest planning session, um, uh, an update on the internship program, which is now in, its, uh, in the phase of uh, getting some interns. Uh, we don't have any quarterly updates for the working groups yet uh, this week, I should say, but we do have one for uh, Borough, and I believe that's that ready to go. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. And then um, <clears throat> we have the continued discussion of going to 1.0 before uh, exiting incubation. So any other topics for today's discussion? Okay, not Todd, you wanna kick it off? Sure thing. <clears throat> All right, so for the Hackfest, I think two things we wanted to discuss today. Let's maybe tackle the easier one first, which is Dubai. Uh, this came up at the Hackfest in LA as well as on the call last week. Um, the sense we're getting is that with uh, the holiday in Europe and just kind of general travel availability, it's sounding like many of the folks from the more seasoned community are not able to travel for this. Um, so it's sounding as though we may just want to turn this into a meetup as opposed to a formal hack fest, but certainly want to close that discussion off with those on this call. Get any, any further input or thoughts on that? Doesn't sound like it, so maybe we should just have a vote quick. Yeah, I, I guess we can, are, are there any objections if we just turn that into a meetup uh, in April, at the end of April for those that are in town, uh, as opposed to doing a formal hack fest? All right, I think you have your answer. All right, sounds good. Uh, and then the second part of the discussion is just kind of around the format of the event. If anyone had further thoughts there, uh, I think a couple of people made the good point that it sounds like there's really two parallel things happening. Uh, one is more focused on bringing new devs up the learning curve, and the other one is really having the more seasoned community focus on cross-project collaboration, hacking, et cetera. Uh, it may make sense to keep the format doing it consecutively, or it may make sense to split this off entirely into two, two unique events. Uh, so curious if there's been any more thoughts from those on the call related to that. <clears throat> Um, I think, you know, what we probably need to do is, uh, I mean, because I, I, I think that having some sort of a road show and maybe have, um, you know, a, a few key individuals join that and, you know, maybe it's a regional kind of a thing with, you know, hitting up a, a, a few cities and doing a meetup a night or something like that for, um, you know, for three consecutive nights or something like that, that that might be the approach to take and they can be you know planned in advance and <clears throat> and maybe we have one of those a quarter i don't know uh, or maybe you know twice a year we do that i don't know um and then um uh, and then just have quarterly uh, hack fest it's, it seems to be the right thing i just don't know i mean <clears throat> it doesn't sound to me like we would be doing the planning i think that's more of a marketing thing probably is that what the thinking is um, I, I probably a combination of a few different functions. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree with Chris here. Um, you know, it's, it's hard for the, the new people to really catch on and do any meaningful work. Um, uh, at a lot of these hack fests and when we host them in places we haven't been before, we tend to get a lot fewer, say developers who really know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so it might be best to do, I, I mean, I, I really, I, I'm in agreement with Chris here that maybe we do, um, we do some core hack fests in places where we have a lot of developers quarterly. And I think I've suggested earlier, like one in East Asia, one in San Francisco, one in New York, and then one in like Amsterdam or London. Yeah. So if we do that quarterly, we hit most of our developers. Um, and then we can do, you know, more roadshow type stuff if we want to do, you know, kind of, if we, if we want to satisfy evangelism, then like Todd, you guys and the marketing committee can say, hey, can you give us, you know, these four technical people for a week to come, 
you know, talk and do evangelism. All right. And there's not to say that we couldn't do a, a meetup in the city that we're in for a hack fest. Um, I mean, I think actually that might be a good idea, but, you know, keep it separate. Keep, keep the functions separate. So kind of like what we did in, I guess that was Chicago, right? Where we had the meetup. Yep. So in the case of Amsterdam, since we already have that one announced and people registering, does it make sense to still keep a training day, but make it very clear that the training day is a one day event and, you know, we just leverage some of the people that are traveling in anyway uh, and focus on that and really make it clear that the following two days are the more advanced hack fest cross project collaboration hacking and have a bit more structured of an agenda there. And while, although it's three days in a row, we really treat them as two separate events or does it make sense to just chop off one day? Yeah. I mean, if everyone's going to be there already, it makes sense to, you know, to have whoever we need to have come early and, talk about evangelism yeah okay I, you know amsterdam we've been there before it's actually pretty active from a hyperledger perspective already um you know with abn amro and and some others um you know really sort of taking a, a large role there I, w I wonder how um, you know, how necessary a day zero is really going to be. I wonder if we could just maybe reach out to um, to some of the, if you will, the locals to get a sense for whether they would think that's uh, a needed function or whether we could just do a meetup. <clears throat> okay. So in general, I mean, I'm a bit concerned with this idea of, of splitting the events entirely for the reason that, so first, I don't know that we'll be able to attract really people to come to a separate event just for evangelization, or if it's any different from all the other things we already do. We have meetups and stuff like this going on, and then, you know, it just falls into that program. And the other part is, I mean, the reason we came up with this D0 idea was because we couldn't stop people from coming during our hack fest, right? And then we felt this was disruptive to the primary goal of the hack fest. And we say, okay, let's have a separate day just for that. And now, yeah, just because we say, okay, we won't have it, are we going to stop people from showing up and having this kind of expectation we're going to introduce them to all the technology? I don't know. So, you know, I understand, you know, it's not like I'm a I'm especially in favor of keeping three days per se. I yeah, just don't well, know that we are not falling back into what we had before and then we haven't solved anything. So right. uh, I mean I, I actually think three days is good. Um but I, I, I do get your I do I do take your point. I think though that by making a little bit clearer what we're trying to achieve. Um, you know, and you know, if you're gonna have a day zero and it's a completely different thing and then we make it very clear that the hack fest or the face to face or whatever we wanted to call it was really intended for those that are already immersed and you know project conversations or project to project conversations that are probably going to be above a lot of um, new people's heads that um, you know right you know that we just by being a little bit clear about how we advertise and market this thing we may um, sort of uh, you know do ourselves a favor you know the the challenges has been in the past that we just have a hack fest and we have an introduction and then you have somebody asking everybody else a lot of questions and so that can be a little bit of um, distraction from actually having the the kind of conversations and and, and work that we i know we all want to do um the other thing for keeping three days is i think that then we would have more opportunity to actually put the working groups in and we could instead of doing tracks we could actually have you know identity and architecture and um you know white paper or something like that where uh, others could participate and we wouldn't have to pick and choose um it just gives us a little bit more time to have those kinds of conversations and i think that for 
many in the community that are participating primarily through the working groups that that would be good <clears throat> and i think it would also be good for the people that are primarily working on uh, writing code to also participate in those so i'm actually in favor of keeping three days but making it a little bit more um whole in terms of with the whole of what we're all doing you know so having you know um uh, actual working group uh, meetings where you know others can participate having the, the you know and then having enough time for the conversations and and cross project collaborations That sounds good to me. The other thing is, you know, we only had one instance of a three-day meeting so far. And, you know, granted, there was fairly low attendance, but that was across the whole meeting, right? And if anything, the day zero, I couldn't attend it, but it sounded like it was oh, reasonably no, successful. Was, right. Day zero was packed. <laughs> so, so, you know, right, okay, so. School, right. We had the high school students and we had a bunch of um college students that showed right. up for day zero for the initial training uh, who then didn't show up for day two and three. And I don't know so, if that's because they thought it was bad, but I think it was mostly because of scheduling they had to go back to class. Right. So that's my point. I, I, you know, I don't think we should necessarily question the whole premise of the three day meeting just because in LA for some reason we didn't have too many people showing up, especially for day two or one and two. So, so can, this is thing. This is thing, Alec. Can I just add something? Because when I speak to new members, um, I do spend a lot of time telling them about the hack fest, and we all do. And we tell them that day one is really a great onboarding for their dev teams, and that they you know don't need to participate in in day two and threes. Or I don't say that. I say you know day twos and threes gets much deeper. So um, yeah, just. That is the way, and maybe it goes back to Chris's comment. Maybe we need to market it better uh, as we, you know, on the web page and when we talk to people about it. But that's how I've been introducing it to folks. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure how much long-term traction we get out of the the uh, day zero type visitors. I think that. I'm interested in more of this deeper collaboration and, and uh, working group progress that we get if if we show up with a structured schedule of this is what we're going to get done and we don't we don't stop people or discourage people from showing up but at least it's clear from the agenda that there's there's topics here that require context uh, so there's probably some investment that needs to be made beforehand if you're going to show up to to one of these you know the other thing that we could do dan on that point is we could actually <clears throat> i mean this is a little bit extra work but whoever it is that normally would that would be maybe doing a day zero presentation of the projects could just record a short video and we could have those posted the week prior advertise them around the the registration, for instance, here's a set of introductory videos that you can go through and, you know, at, uh, on your own time uh, to give people some of that context. Um, and then allowing us to have the full time for our own conversations. I, just a thought. Um, so I suggested this in chat. But I think maybe if we had a separate registration process for the day zero and the actual hack fest, it might serve as, you know, an, if, an effective filter. Yeah. Well, like I said, I, Todd, I would go with back to Tim and some of the other guys there in Amsterdam. I don't know who you've cool. been with. And yeah, Yuri, I, Tim, and a few others. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I would just get there. Um, their thoughts. Um, okay. We have enough time to plan it. All right. Sounds good. Uh, and then one other quick question, and then I think let's wrap this up just because we have other topics. Um, is it, in terms of a quarterly cadence, you know, with Dubai not happening, is there a hunger to try to get 
either a US-based Hackfest or more likely an Asia-based Hackfest slotted in sometime from now until the end of June when we're in Amsterdam. It's coming. I didn't catch that, Chris. You know, while because I'm I'm assuming that a lot of people are going to be at, at consensus. Maybe I'm wrong. So, Chris, I think we lost most of what you said. Um, we heard it's yeah, complex. Yeah, I, and then I'm consensus. in a hotel and my. <laughs> Right. I'll put it in the chat, but basically I'm suggesting we might want to do maybe one day around consensus. Uh, we heard that. All right. If, if there's no other thoughts on this, we can kick it off uh, an email thread. Um, Otherwise, I know we got some other stuff to get through today. Yep. All okay. Right. So let's jump to Burrow, I guess. Oh, no, internship program. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, just really quickly on the internship program 12 projects. We're accepting applications from students now. Please help us promote that in the agenda that went out. Um, there's a link to the blog with more details, as well as some links if you want to click to tweet and promote to your uh, communities. All right, That's super. And uh, so next up would be Burrow. Silas on. Hi, sorry, I managed to get into a pen drawing mode. Um, hi everyone, this is Silas. Um, so I've posted uh, the, the update. Um, if you want to be able to follow this as I go, there's also other couple of documents I've done uh, one being a roadmap post-mortem, um, which I might refer to, uh, of, of the Q1 roadmap that I did for the last update. Um, and the other being a draft roadmap for Q2, um, that I'll work through for, for the update as it stands. So, um, yeah, in terms of project health, uh, my feeling is that Borough has been gaining momentum in terms of, um, useful contributions on, uh, the Hyperledger chat in particular. Um, there's a few users that I'll mention later who've done some useful stuff, including building a, uh, a, a truffle-like um, package for uh, Burrow, uh, package manager uh, for Solidity code. Um, the refactor um, was a fairly big undertaking. Um, it meant Refactoring not only the Burrow code, but also getting all of our tooling into a into a mono re repo called Bosmama. Um, but in the process, a lot of existing bugs um, were dealt with, uh, including a lot of a lot of panics, a lot of uh, type safety issues. Um, but still, uh, not huge progress on actual features, um, which was was expected. But I kind of hope it, hope to have closed it off a bit quicker. Um, so the main issues that we have, uh, and some of these have a good chance of being uh, closed off in in what remains of Q1. Um, so one is EVM compatibility. So uh, I've got um, a developer who's now up to speed from Tata Consulting, um, who's been working on these EVM issues and has uh, uh, an implementation waiting in the wings for the revert opcode. But there's a number of new opcodes, um, and we're now in a Good position to uh, to implement them. What I'm also doing at the, at the moment is integrating the Ethereum uh, has some table-based JSON tests um, available to all Ethereum clients, um, some of which can be translated to Burrow. So I wanted to integrate those to uh, help us assert the correctness of the upgrades we do have. So for example, I found a bug uh, with the help of one of the one of the users who came on the Hyperledger chat. Uh, in our sign extension, which basically meant that using uh, types narrower than 256 bits that were positive uh, was actually broken on this sign extension. It, it didn't set the sign bit correctly, uh, which is kind of a fundamental thing to find. Um, 
kind of strengthens the case for needing this um, level of testing. Uh, another issue we've, we've had quite a bit of, um, which pulls me in multiple directions, is the lack of decent up-to-date documentation. We have some kind of extensive tutorials from the previous iteration of Monax, the company, which I point people towards. Um, but there's a, a lot of that has atrophied uh, where it sits, or there's just a lack of sort of basic information about well, how how is our permission system defined. It's not that complicated if you read the code, but um, I actually did add some comments on that. Um, to that end, uh, there are three uh, more junior developers from TCS who have worked on a package of documentation, which due to some kind of arcane legal processes, I haven't actually been able to see, uh, but hopefully that will give a, I spent several hours presenting Borrow to them and asked them to uh, put that into an overall kind of architecture piece of documentation. We also have a former employee from Monax who was deep in the tooling for years, who is working on consolidating um, a lot of our documentation. So I, I hope that will help uh, it. But on the other hand, it's something that I could certainly do with, with help, help with because there are certain Monax priorities that involve Burrow that, that are kind of trumping spending time on documenting what's already there. Um, and the other big one, and this relates to what I bring up in the Q1 post-mortem would be uh, Web3 support. Um, partly, we internally reprioritize that. We are taking Burrow into production using our existing um, JavaScript APIs. Um, there's also were some issues with, uh, we, we had been hoping to collaborate with um, the people from Fabric EVM on a Go-based uh, Web3 RPC, but uh, they've decided to take a different approach. So that's something that hasn't happened that was planned. For community, then I think having Web3 support is quite a big deal for adoption. Um, but like I say, from, from my day job, um, it, it, it wasn't really in the high priority uh, set of things to work on with, with Burrow. But for Hyperledger, it, it would be really useful if we could uh, get some movement on that um, within Burrow. Um, that there is a, a prototype or more than a prototype, I guess an alpha or beta um, web three implementation on the uh, uh, on Seth uh, Sawtooth uh, with Burrow. Um, uh, but that's written in Rust and we wanted one to go. Um, so there hasn't been a release yet. There's quite likely since the last um, uh, update, um, there's quite likely to be one uh, this month, I would say, um, we're closing in on it. Largely, that's been down to the refactor, as I already mentioned. Be a zero eighteen zero would be the release, even though really it deserves a major point release. We're reserving a one because of the semantics that rightly or wrongly have become attached to that. Um, the other thing that I'd like to start doing once that point release is out is uh, integrating both in Fabric EVM and uh, Sawtooth, the new changes, which are numerous and, and worth having, particularly in terms of EVM compatibility, that allows us to use the latest Solidity compiler, um, 0421. Um, so uh, activity, so the, this big refactor named Hypermama, that successfully completed, um, uh, introduced a lot of safety, um, removed a lot of panics, mostly just really needed doing for sanity and maintainability. Um, what we ended up, I ended up doing in a, uh, probably to a higher level than I'd expected, but also took a bit more time was the establishment of this mono repo. So in reality, to, to, to be able to test Burrow um, and successfully uh, and to use it, all of our tooling that we would, we had slightly optimistically thought we could deprecate um, has had to stick around. So we now have a mono repo that has our compiler service, our key signing daemon, our JavaScript libraries, um, and our, our package manager and integration um, tests uh, in it. And there is now a sort of uh, kind of dependency between Burrow and uh, Boz Marmot, which is the name of this mono repo for testing. So they both run a, a quite a full set of integration level tests uh, on any pull request. So that certainly gives a bit more certainty. Um, the uh, upgrade to Tenement 0.15.0, that has loads and loads of improvements. Um, there's actually a 0.16, bit of a moving target with Tenement, um, but they're moving towards their 1.0 release for their Cosmos network, and uh, we should be able to track them fairly quickly. We've also pushed various changes to Tenement um, around uh, signing, um, 
because we run Tendermint within a single process and we need a bit more control over how we configure the node. Uh, yeah, removal of a fairly large tens of different panics. Um, it's a bit of a panic happy code base in some places. Um, uh, and the event system uh, to synchronize with Tendermint was, was replaced and areas where they were blocking on events and so on was removed. So really heavily code quality improvements um, with, with some feature level things around. Uh, there's now a query language for events and uh, logging, um, all of which were needed for debugging. So um, I'm just going to flick over to the post-mortem just to see if there's anything um, to mention there. Yeah, no, okay, I think I can leave that off offline. Um, so the current plans, um, and these are, these are being driven as well by our um, uh, use of, of Burrow for our, our product, which will be going into production Q2, Q, Q3 this year. Um, so uh, a governance transaction, which will be, uh, initially it will be something of a pointy stick that will allow you to redistribute, redistribute um, validator voting power relating to the consensus mechanism and the native token uh, across all accounts. Um, ultimately, we will want this under control of a, of a governance, autonomous governance contract, but um, it will be building towards that. Um, and that will also be reintroducing validator set, set changes, which have been um, uh, commented out in an earlier form of validator bonding for a while. Um, we have another uh, team member joining who has a lot of database experience and we'll be working on um, upgrading our uh, uh, Merkle tree to uh, something that Tendermint have been working on and providing their SDK, but needs a little bit of work, but has some very interesting types of um, uh, range proofs and other um, Merkle tree based proofs that it can provide, um, which we're going to want for, for running Burrow um, in this sort of multiple chain universe. Um, uh, state history, so that will be linked. We'll be able to have a queryable uh, EVM history at any block. Um, uh, which is which would be nice n a nice feature something that go ethereum doesn't won't have in quite the same form um the event fire hose this is the ability to uh, get a catch-all uh consumer for both consensus events and evm events which are defined at the contract level and are, are the way that um facility drives a lot of external processes currently we you subscribe to that over a web socket but if you lose an event there's no easy way to to look back at previous ones um so this can give an experience that maybe feels a bit more like kafka or something like that um yeah queryability of events there validator bonding yeah it's it's, it's linked so we, we need a way of changing validator sets um and then a, a a serialization of state um and restoring that state so to being able to ship uh our state backends around to different uh ephemeral nodes and Kubernetes um, is kind of what that's about, but also just giving uh, an upgrade path. So if we can have a reasonably stable state store that we can dump to, uh, we'd upgrade that to a chain that could read that in. Um, on maintainer diversity, so so Tyler Tyler Jackson from Monax, one of, one of the founders of Monax has been getting more involved and I would consider him a maintainer now of, of Burrow. Um, me and Casey are still still going. We have this new team men member joining, Sean, um, who will most likely be a maintainer. And then there's another Sean from TCS who is keen to become a maintainer uh, and they're kind of spinning up. I don't know, perhaps I could have some guidance on, on what level of competence with the code base we should be waiting for before calling someone a maintainer. I'm fairly relaxed on how we do that, but, but uh, perhaps wanted to give people a bit more time to get up to speed. Um, in terms of con contributors, and I'd like to think some of these people will be potential maintainers as well. So Sean uh, Blucker from TCS I already mentioned. Uh, Ahmad uh, Pulazade um, has done something quite interesting called Snap, which is um, similar to uh, Ethereum Truffle, but using our JavaScript APIs. He just uh, came onto the chat and had this thing. Um, so I've been trying to get his interest in perhaps maintaining uh, our JavaScript libraries as part of Bosmarmot, um, uh, whether they end up being an interim thing or turn into their own, uh, you know, stick around as an, as, as an interface to borrow that's still useful, I'm not sure, um, you know, if Web3 is around. 
and, and Robert D. Bills has been building uh, Kubernetes uh, integrations. Um, and uh, Adam, uh, early on, uh, Adam Ludwig from Sawtooth uh, helped, helped me merge the large uh, hypermarmot refactor, helped me uh, review it. Um, yeah, some other stuff I think I mentioned there. So, and then, yeah, I guess, so the final thing to say is that, that we will be putting our own uh, product into production on top of Burrow, which is our legal agreements network um, in Q2 and Q3. So uh, this both kind of ups the ante for us in terms of testing around certain things like EVM compatibility um, and, and correctness of uh, things like um, validator set changes and so on. But it also means that the focus is really there for us and, and things like documentation, possibly things like what we had hoped to prioritize around Web3, uh, they matter less for us now. Um, I'm very uh, interested in getting people from the community to work on that stuff. Um, but uh, that's, that's just, uh, I guess, the way the priorities lie with uh, Monax. So uh, yeah, I think that's all. Any questions from anyone on any, uh, any the project? again, if my. Yeah, Chris, I think your line's dropping out. Uh, any questions from anyone on the call for Silas around the uh, Hyperledger Bro update? Hey, Silas, this is Dan. That's a really thorough update. I appreciate you getting into such detail there. Um, I was curious, did you. Uh, did you jury rig the uh, pull request number for your, your giant merge to make that 666? <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. Um, uh, I didn't. Um, uh, it, was, it was not, not an earthly hand that, that did that. Um, it's, uh, I guess, I guess Burrow, ha but Burrow already has a subterranean feel. Um, <laughs> but you make of that what you will. Uh, more substantive question. It, so it's not like you've got one external repository that you're relying on for your uh, testing. Uh, everything else, though, is in the, the Burrow uh, repo. Yeah, so um, we, we had certainly flirted with dropping all of our stuff, much of which we could Apache license into Burrow. Um, there are two reasons, one hard reason and, and one software reason that we haven't done that. The harder reason is that we still within, um, so what was Monax packages do, which is part of the, the Monax tool, I've stripped all of the Docker dependencies and a lot of the uh, kind of incidental complexity of that out. And I've just kept the package manager. So well, the package manager is a bit more than that. It, it reads these epm.yaml uh, files, which and it can, can deploy contracts, it can call functions, it can uh, apply assertions. So it's a mixture of a test framework uh, sort of package deployer um, and various things. It's what we use for integration tests. It's what we use to push contracts. That relies on Go Ethereum's ABI. Um, it would be a non-trivial but not particularly um, excessive piece of work to get an Apache licensed ABI, but I am not a, a familiar with one. So the ABI is the application binary interface um, uh, for uh, well, for the EVM, um, strongly influenced by Solidity. So if you want to call a function and you want to know how to pack the bytes for a particular function call and you want to know how to derive the, um, the, the dispatch hash for that function and all that sort of stuff, it's in the ABI. Um, it would be nice to have an Apache license ABI. So that keeps part of what's in Boss Marm up there. Um, I've actually dropped some GPL dependencies on things like Monax keys, which there is, I think there is an argument for that becoming part of Burrow which is our key signing daemon. And particularly as Burrow takes on the ability to um, be a delegate for other keys that are within, within this Monax key container, uh, that may well move to Burrow. Um, but, but the main idea was to get all of this stuff that you, you still essentially need to use Burrow um, into a single repo and to, to have it maintained. So we, we lost our, our person who had been working on our JavaScript working in a bit of a silo to be honest um as well um and 
we lost various people working on compilers and so on. So I am taking on maintaining that and Bosmarmot is a, is a package that is sort of maintainable size. Um, and I, you know, I feel like I can kind of iterate on, um, it's not entirely clear at this stage what it will be become, but um, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of essential, essential really for, for someone getting into Burrow right now. Um, as we, as we transition into this, into the new code base. Okay, thanks. And then I imagine Adam probably has a good idea what's involved since he's, since he did review your big refactor. Um, but I know yeah, yeah. Uh, we're all interested in getting uh, the, you know, all, all the benefits of that refactor uh, integrated into Seth properly. So we're not working off of that uh, fork. So any guidance that uh, you can suggest that um, and probably defer first to Adam to see what we need to understand, but you know, we're looking forward to. Yeah. So I think, I think the thing, thing with that will be probably to, um, I, I need to get out this, this 018 zero release. Um, just, just to give a little bit of a, a, a rubber stamp to the, there and then, and then it would be best if we had Seth depend on um, on, on Burrow as, a, as an actual dependency. And I'd note that if we use Go's new depth tool, uh, which is the first dependency management for Go that actually seems to work, um, it will strip out unnecessary files. So you should be able to take just the Burrow um, EVM components and, and they're all encapsulated in a bit of a better way now as well. But, but there, there are some critical bug fixes in there. So you guys will want it, um, I think. Great. Any other questions, comments for Silas? Thank you. Whoever is Got a lot of background noise, might want to go mute, please. All right. Um, okay, so up next is uh, continuing the discussion on whether you know a project can go to 1.0 um, uh, before it leaves incubation, or you know what are the implications um, uh, of that. Um, I think you know the you know where we had left it off and can. Where's my the chat? Somebody paste in that link there. Thanks, Todd. So we had, you know, continuing discussion. I think Dan, your point was that you think it is required. Um, Hart, you seemed to be uh, sort of required. <laughs> uh, I don't know if anybody else had any thoughts, but you know, personally, I think um, uh, I, I I tend to think that. You know, when you're when you're talking about 1.0, the code is you know either mature or it's not. It's um, uh, but you know, as I think, mm, and I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Hart was talking about. You know, are we dis you know disadvantaging some of the uh, the the non-core platforms, if you will, if they have a small team, if they have a robust and mature code base? Is that any less robust and mature? Um, obviously, from a you know, building a community, getting other, you know, getting uh, committer diversity, getting maintainer diversity. Um, some of those other things may be harder to achieve with a smaller project. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, you know, my personal preference would be, I could see where a project could say, well, we think we're at 1.0, but from a Hyperledger Linux Foundation, you know, supporting marketing, supporting with the, uh, you know, security scan and and um, bug bounty and all the other things that go with it including press releases and so forth that 
that that wouldn't necessarily be <clears throat> um, done then if that's you know if that were the case but uh, you know again um, uh, i'm i'm just sort of coming at it from the perspective that says you know i think that we we definitely want to encourage people to get out of incubation quickly um, but that can be hard um, and i think we all are aware that um, you know, we need to all do better, I think, on uh, growing that diversity and taking down some of the, you know, sort of the, the cloistered walls around our various projects. Uh, and um, you know, that's, it's clearly something we need to be focusing on, but I don't know if that necessarily means we penalize a project. Um, Silas again, actually, I mean, this is something that I, I didn't, actually directly bring up it's kind of it's something i've spoken to casey uh, our ceo about and um, would have a perspective on so if you take perhaps take borrow as a as a case study um so we have some of the uh the majority of the best practice practices badge that's actually one thing that did last quarter as well um and in terms of our code base age having our first commits back in like i think december 2014 we're actually older than um than all of the uh, well possibly all certainly uh, sawtooth and fabric projects so in pure age <laughs> which is not i think quite what is meant by maturity we're older but we've also gone through some some gymnastics and i wouldn't with the stuff that i've worked on recently want to put borrow into 1.0 yet however i may want to do that um uh a, a, a bit sooner um and with us still being in incubation, um, I guess I actually wasn't even aware that that was potentially impediment. So um, it, I, guess it, I guess it depends how hard it is to get out of incubation. Um, but certainly I would at some point feel like I'd want to give the signaling of a one point. I mean, I also would just like to just get onto a rapid release schedule and actually use major releases in the sort of semantic versioning, um, meaning uh, in which case we, we I mean, I, I nearly did this six months ago, to be honest, to, to, to get onto a, um, you know, if it was a major release, breaking changes, as a lot of the releases are, to, to just do it. But uh, that's the perspective from Burrow. So Chris, I mean, you mentioned there's like this, seems like there is no clear, um, there's no clarity on whether the current status of things is whether there is any requirement or not. I, I would claim there isn't any requirement as of today that those two things are separated and there's nothing in our documentation anywhere that says otherwise. If anybody believes that's not the case, I'd be, I'd be interested to hear where there is a mention of any kind of requirement. Now, this is not to say that we shouldn't have one, but I think it's important to agree on what the status quo is because otherwise, I mean, we have a bigger problem if we don't even agree on where we are. Yeah, so I don't think we defined the policy, right? I think right, we, we took it on a project by project, right? Fabric was like really pushing for a one zero because it was a signal to the market. We felt that a few features are mature enough. And, you know, all the maintainers were happy to sign it off. So we said, okay, look, let's just... Hearing me? Can you hear me? I got that. Yeah, I can hear all of you guys, but Jonathan's coming in really... Uh, not noisy yeah yeah there's it's not a good not a very no, 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 no. crisp sound okay then i'm not gonna say anything i'm fine i, I don't know what to do i'm in a loud place maybe i'll move but i i, just, yeah, I, I can hear you fine i can try, try to say it like maybe in a, in a short the short version is i think we wanted to keep it uh open at the beginning. who is you in that sentence <laughs> jonathan I see. I, no, I, I just looked at like how how we did one zero, right? We just we had enough of we had like a quorum, right? We had an agreement on okay, let's go to one zero. The beginning we were thinking about March thirtieth, right? We communicated like April, so more or less. Then we added some more features that are related to the channels, and then everybody said, okay, let's get it out of the door, right? There was no people really wanted one zero in fabric, right? But we didn't want to force it, like. Now that I'm in the TSC, and I never had, like even when I was always listening to the TSC, I never had the policy kind of either encouraging or discouraging people from going 
to to a one zero release. So I felt I, I I believed all the time that we wanted to keep it flexible. That that was kind of my assumption, you know. But if if you want to if you if you want to like, you know, define a policy, then maybe we should. If people think that we should discuss that, because there are pros and cons, right? There are pros and cons to encouraging people to go one zero soon or making it harder to go one zero, or to just to get out of the incubation, right? However we call that that step. Because I, I, I what I said like last week, I think it is a big step. I think I think it is, you know, a, a game changing event. It's not like it's like 0 0.92 is not the same as 1.0.1, if you see what I mean, right? It does the release cycle. As a signal to the market, is how much money Hyperledger invests in it in terms of auditing and, you know, all, all the other all bag of things that come, you know, and the good things that, that come along with the 1.0 release, right? So getting out of incubation. The question is, do we want to encourage it or do we want to really make it a strict uh, process? I don't know how people feel, but... I'm open to, to, to suggestions and I'll mute myself now. Sorry. We, yeah, so I, I think to uh, uh, the, the earlier point, no, we do not have a policy on it. And I think what we're discussing is do we want to create a policy? And yeah. I think it makes sense that if, if we're going to put some sort of marketing backing behind things or just even the notion that that uh, Hyperledger supports the the concept that his particular project is production ready, that it has to have some level of maturity behind it, and uh, so it makes sense to me that that uh, a project be in an active state at the point that they're declaring a one zero. Um, or you know, the, the opposite of that is it seems like it would be odd for something to claim that it's production worthy when it's still being incubated. Um, so I'll, I'll just sort of go back to the conversations that we had around incubation and maturity of the project itself from a code <coughs> and we made a clear distinction that they're unrelated you know exiting from incubation doesn't mean the code is mature it means that the community is mature um, it doesn't necessarily mean the code is production ready it means that the community has met the criteria that we outlined in um, the, the project life cycle we didn't talk about, you know, releases in that context, but you could, I think, make a compelling argument to say that if code maturity is not a requirement for exiting incubation, then why should exiting incubation be a prerequisite for community or project, you know, community maturity? And, um, now again, I, th I think that these are independent contexts. Again, I think I can appreciate that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily want to be in a situation where somebody comes in and is not putting in, uh, you know, immediately after they incubate their project, they go to 1.0 and expect all the marketing and so forth. I think that's probably something we want to try and avoid. Um, and, um, um, you know, I think there needs to be a certain um, expectation that there's act active efforts ongoing to improve the community maturity around a project. Uh, but uh, again, I'm, you know, I'm just mindful of the fact that we made a clear distinction between code and community when we made the decision around whether or not the code had to be at, you know, sort of production grade before you could exit incubation. And I guess I'm saying, why would we have that a different discussion in the other direction? I think I would just point out that when um, project goes to 1.0, that it does send a certain signal to people who are using that product that it will be, um, that it will exist, right? It continue yep. to exist and, and be something that can be used. 
right? And so this is the only reason that I think, Chris, I completely agree with the fact that we've written um, that incubation and, and code level kind of don't go hand in hand, right? But I, I think in, on the other end, you have to think about the people who are using the project and thinking, oh, this is 1.0, this community is going to continue to exist and I can go ahead and um, you know, base my product on this and, and work from here, right? So I think that's the only thing that I would bring up as a, a possible concern with the other way around, right? Um, not being active for 1.0. And well, the, the counterpoint is that a project just could be small, right? Like if I, if, you know, say Mick and I write some small little library that's like 300 lines of code and doesn't need much maintenance or something, but a lot of people uses it. Well, you know, maybe we don't have a large number of contributors just because we don't need it. Um, and if we were to go away, then someone else would just pick it up because it was simple. Yeah, I think we shouldn't get too focused on the number of contributors. Diversity is important in ensuring that the project remains if, if uh, one participant or one company goes away. But I think the other things we look for in an active project are maturity in the, in the processes. So you've got the CIA th CII things covered. Uh, you've got some sort of, uh, you know, build integration, unit test coverage, uh, your licenses are checked out. Uh, you know, all these things are are part of a picture of maturity that seem to me as precursors for declaring production level maturity. I, Dan, I completely agree with that. That that if the code is mature, this process is going to go very fast. But there's still a process to be followed and a bunch of gates that we've put in place um, that that trigger actions both in the you know both as a sort of reflection of code but also trigger actions on the working groups part from um, security audits to um, marketing pieces of it as well um, it, a 1.0 and an arbitrary release is fine but a 1.0 coming from hyperledger contains at least some stamp of blessing that that we should be able to address. I, I would like to suggest that we may have a look at uh, what, what happened in other communities like the OpenStack and uh, Apache. So in my opinion, Oh, I think we lost your audio, Bawa. Oh, it looks like you may have gone back on mute. So, um, I may input in the chat later. Okay. Sorry with my microphone. Yeah. So I don't think we're necessarily ready to completely close this off. Um, it sounds like I think there's, you know, there's good points on both sides, right? So, <laughs> um, uh, I suggest we continue on the mailing list and pick it up again next week, and hopefully I will have better audio. Any other discussion topics? If not, I can give people a couple minutes. All right. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you all soon. Thanks, all. Thank you.